It's my uh, pleasure to introduce this year's John Vanier uh, lecture, which has a particular poignance with John passing on over the past few weeks. So we, uh, we very much look forward to this lecture, but at the same time, we, we remember John and all that he's done for each one of us here and, and for the world. Um, Talitha Kurman, who is the, our lecturer the, 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 this year, is a good friend of mine, which is nice in itself. Everybody needs friends. I, it's actually she's probably the only friend I have. The, um, she uh, works at the University of Leuven in Belgium, uh, but lives in France. So she, uh, she crosses cultures. What, last time I was at a conference, or the, the time before, I was at a conference with Talitha. She drove from France to uh, Switzerland, which is where the, the conference was, in an electric car, not realizing that the PowerPoints in Switzerland were different from France. So it's like having a flat iPad, it's just pointless. So she spent two days of the conference searching for a, a point to plug her car into. So um, intellectually, you know how it is. <laughs> but Talitha's doing some really interesting work just now. Uh, she wrote a paper not so long ago on um, asking the question, were Adam and Eve disabled? And it's a very interesting take on the doctrine of creation in relation to disability. Uh, and her area of interest, and our shared area of interest, is in dementia. And dementia and friendship is her, her uh, main research project, I think, at this moment in time. And dementia, as all of you know, is a, a very important, very interesting, and, and deeply theological area. And so she's doing some very interesting, new, and fascinating work. So, Talitha, with no more from me, we're very, very grateful that you're here, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, John, and well does the perspective change from this side of the, ro of the room. Um, I'm a bit impressed, I must say, because, um, well, the Summer Institute is something I've been talking about to people in France and in Belgium and in Europe so many times, and um, I was wanting to be here of several times. I never made it, and I never, ever thought I'd be here at this side of the stage and doing the Jean Vanier lecture at such a special time in history. Um, Karen, uh, sorry, Carmen yesterday told us that we were all located and um, well, as John said, I'm located in France and Belgium. I'm a Roman Catholic and um, I wrote a dissertation in French, which is inaccessible for some of you, and so I never ever thought I'd make it. My disbelief is enormous, and I am so grateful to be here, and I'm so grateful for Bill and John and, and Eric and, and, and Ben and all the others to give me the chance to talk to you today. Let me just put that a little bit higher. Okay. So yes, thanks for taking the risk of naming me, and. Thank you for calling this the Emerging Scholar uh, Award and not the Young Scholar Award. <laughs> it opens up a few possibilities for other PhD students. Um, and I was asked by Bill Gaventa to not present my thesis research, sorry, my uh, PhD research. That would have been easy. I can talk for hours with no notes about my PhD research. No, I was asked to talk to you about my current work in progress. John said it's about dementia and I'm only seven months into this research so it's nothing finished yet and I feel very, very uncomfortable of talking to you about it. It's a scope, it's another uh, first ever um, public speech on my on my research, so um, please bear with me, and I'll be grateful for any comments, good or bad. Uh, no, forget that, I'll just take the good ones. <laughs> and um, yeah, let's go. 
got the PowerPoint behind me, but I haven't got the, 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 the thing. So shall I just, shall somebody bring it to me or shall I just say, ah, look, here it's coming. No, thank you. We can applaud this young lady for bringing the, and it's the one. Towards the computer? Oh, here it is. Okay, good. So, here we go. Let me, let me introduce you to Betty. Betty is a charming elderly lady I met a few months ago, and she has just this beautiful, white, curly hair, uh, hair and blue piercing eyes. She has three daughters and a bunch of grandchildren, but she's not exactly sure how many she has. She lives in a residential care facility in a protected living area. Last autumn, when she was still living at her home, she suddenly collapsed, undernourished and dehydrated. She was placed in residential care to make sure she got her daily no portion of nutrients. And her eldest daughter comes to see her on a daily basis. And one couple of friends of her drops by nearly every week. Her other friends stopped seeing her when she entered the care facility. Are you my friend? She asks me on our very first meeting. And I am startled by that question. Isn't friendship a funny thing? Everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say the word friendship. And still we all articulate that concept in a very different way. Philosophers and sociologists and theologians uh, and even psychologists do not really agree on what friendship exactly means. So I'm certainly not going to try to define it. I'll just say that it is nice to have friends, right? Um, there was a 12th century Sister Sentian abbot who said, life has little charm without friends, and I think a lot of people would agree on that. And I'm not taking much risk if I say that it is important for people to have friends and to be with them if we want to thrive and to flourish. Still, when living with cognitive impairment, it is not always easy to find friends. The American Psychiatric Association stated that intellectual disability impacts the person's ability to make and retain friendships. But Hans, Hans Reinders, he should come up here. Oh no, sorry, I forgot to show this one. It's not Hans Reinders. <laughs> Okay, okay some, some people have not fallen asleep yet, thank you. So, we should come now. Yeah, okay, here he is, sorry Hans. <laughs> now, Hans countered this APA statement when he wrote that disabled people are rarely chosen as friends unless by other disabled people. Disability and friendship don't come together all that easily. And this explains most certainly why there is so much research going on on disability and friendship. Fostering friendships beyond the barriers of disability prejudice was the key issue of my thesis research. I believe that friendship is a major lever on the road to an inclusive society and not necessarily the other way around. Friendship cannot be implemented by equal rights laws, nor can access regulations guarantee friendship. It is neither because an environment is inclusive or, nor because a building is accessible that the people inside are going to be friends. And that is why it seems so important to me and to all of you, I am sure, I'm not saying anything new, but that uh, friendships are enabled among all. Because when people manage to build friendships, friendships beyond the barriers of disability prejudice, then we are will building a welcoming and belonging, inclusive society. A society where all belong, 
regardless of health, wealth, ability, or even memory. Indeed, people with memory issues often face similar problems to people with intellectual disabilities. Dementia takes its toll on social relationships, and many friends just disappear when the disease sets in. So helping people to sustain friendships with persons who have dementia-related issues is my current research project. I'm trying to see how Christian spirituality may help people to remain friends with people affected by dementia. Jean Vanier certainly got it right when he started building arch communities, precisely basing them on friendship beyond the barriers of disability. And Hans and John Swinton and Eric Carter and Jason Creek, so many others have written extensively on the subject. And there is a growing awareness that friendship is a major issue for inclusion. The challenge we are facing now as Christian communities is how we can implement Jean Vanier's model everywhere. I think it's time to move beyond the social model or the social human rights model and foster a friendship model. A friendship model would focus on changing people's perception of themselves in the first place and then of others, regardless of health, wealth or ability. A friendship model could focus on how we all consider ourselves and how we deal with our common vulnerability on which Thomas Reynolds has so beautifully written and how this vulnerability draws us together and enriches our lives because it enables us to love. Indeed, you cannot love if you are not vulnerable. Now, throughout history, there are not all that many models of friendship. It's easy to find famous models of lovers, like, uh, let me see, I put them on here somewhere. See if it works better. Come on. I'm certainly not doing that. Who's not praying to the spirit of computers? OK, there we go. You know these ones, Adam and Eve, sorry. Ah, OK, but then that way. OK. Oh, yes, it works too. Now, you know these ones, this... No, you don't know them? Now you do. Cle Cleopatra and, uh, and Mary and Joseph. Bonnie and Clyde. All these are fam famous couples of lovers. <laughs> but I found it more difficult to find uh, famous friendships. Um, do you know these two? Ah. You know who these are? Yeah, good. <laughs> so our New Zealand friends are happy to see Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, who climbed the Everest. Somebody died on the Everest yesterday. Um, this one I found very difficult. Uh, uh, for, the, for our American friends, Thomas, uh, John Adams and uh, Thomas Jeff Jefferson. And, and uh, last night when lying awake, because when you travel 55 hours and you're not a young but an emerging scholar, you have some difficulty getting over jet lag. So when I was lying awake, I thought, but it was too late for the PowerPoint, of um, Don Shirley and Tony Vallelonga from the movie Green Book. Yeah, uh, okay. So there are some famous models, but they're not all that many. Um, not in history, anyhow, but look at these. Ah, this one we know, don't we? Uh, and this one too. You may not know this one. It's called Nello and Patrash, and they're from, it's a story from Hoboken, where my father came from, so this is a tribute to my father, and, oh, sorry, come on, ah, you know these ones, yeah, you know these, now, one thing I want to attract your attention to is that, isn't it funny that these are all friendships between, between very different individuals, ah, it means unexpected friendships are desirable, 
in our imagination, we long for unexpected friendships. Doesn't that open a whole lot of perspectives? Okay, now as a Christian, I believe that the biggest role model when it comes to friendship might well be this one. Without any surprise, Uh, this is Jesus and one of his friends, the Saint Manasseh. I think Jesus is the quintessential friend and his example should nourish the way Christians foster friendships with other people. Now in this presentation I would like to focus on the way Jesus acted towards one particular friend of his, Lazarus, and how this example can nurture every human being's action. And um, my, construct, my presentation is constructed in three points. A short introduction on why I read the Bible the way I do. And then I'm going to walk you through the story of Lazarus. And um, this is going to take some time. So it's the moment to sleep is the middle part. And as a final conclusive remark, I'll tell you what I plan to do with all this when the research is over. So, uh, nothing definite here, it's really just my thinking going on. Now, this brings me to our first point, why am I doing this? Ah, oh, come on. Ah, it's not the right Lazarus, but I really wanted a drawing of Jean Vanier in here. Um, so, no, oh, this is too quickly, sorry. Why am I doing this? Uh, Barb and Shelley told us on Monday that we have to know where we stand on. And in uh, 1997, Tom Kitwood, I, there's something wrong with the PowerPoint, so let's, let's just get back to that. Yeah, sorry, here it is. Tom Kitwood, who developed the person-first approach, wrote that the reconstruction of dementia requires much more than a paradigmatic change of understanding. The strategic task is one of cultural transformation. And in this cultural transformation, our churches have a role to play. We have to become part of a peace culture, as Jason told us on Tuesday. We can bring about a paradigm shift, as Christopher Reichmann told us this morning. We must not focus solely on the ecclesial practice of accompanying people with dementia and their caregivers. I think the church can contribute to change people's perception on the person affected by dementia. All people's perception, whether you are a caregiver, a family member, a patient, a neighbor, the postman, or a friend, it is necessary for all of us to shift our gaze in order to counter the societal negativity that surrounds dementia. And pedagogical work is necessary to combat these negative feelings and educate everybody's gaze to see that within the framework of cognitive impairment, there is not only the disappearance of possibilities, but also a lot of possibilities offered. Now, this re-education of the minds and attitudes involves, among other things, a re-reading of the Bible and its narratives. Because like Saint Bonaventure, I suggest that we use scripture as a corrective to a dark reading of the world, or as John Swinton would say, as a powerful counter-narrative. When we begin to think differently about scripture and read it in the light of human vulnerability, somebody's not agreeing with me, is he? <laughs> if we read the scripture in the light of human vulnerability, this opens up a whole new way of understanding our humanness. So, in this lecture, I would like to use the story of Lazarus, and now we have it, and tell a different story about it. I'm not going to try to identify what the text meant when it was written in the world of the first centuries. 
I attempt to discover what it means today in the 21st century to a reader who is trying to understand the meaning of a life in which Alzheimer's disease or dementia has made an intrusion. I'm using both words because in, in a French-speaking context, people would talk about Alzheimer, whereas in English-speaking world, you talk more about dementia. But I use the two and actually talk about the same thing. Okay, uh, so for this reader, there is no other world in which her life is experienced. And God's message transcends, of course, the historical context of the first centuries and remains significant today. And anyway, we can only imperfectly reconstruct the culture that gave birth to the biblical text. Therefore, what follows is a contextual hermeneutical search. I seek what the story can reveal to us about God and about ourselves in our world in a given context, in this case, that of a life where everything changes when dementia strikes. So let us step in Jesus' footsteps and listen to this story. Every Bible story has something to say to every human being. So to what extent is this story of Lazarus and Martha and Mary and Jesus relevant to the contemporary reader in the midst of existential questions? There is an essential message in, God's, uh, in John's uh, gospel, and it goes something like, no matter what happens, no matter how blurry the horizon may seem, God does not leave us alone. He comes to meet us and he calls us to step outside. That is the essential message. But there are other messages in this text and I suggest that we look at the story of Jesus and Lazarus in a fresh way and shake up traditions. So, the story goes, there was a man named Lazarus and he was sick he was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister, Ma Martha. Do we know what Lazarus was suffering from? No, we don't. Jean Vanier suggested that Lazarus had an intellectual disability, which could explain why he was living in Martha's house, with his two sisters taking care of him. The hypothesis has not really been challenged, and it is making its way into the thinking of disability theologians. But it is, of course, only an assumption. And as Jean Vanier said himself, and I quote him, in, in no essence does it alter the way, sorry, in no way, I'll start the quote again, sorry. So Jean Vanier said, it alters in no way the essence of what John is trying to tell us here about Jesus' love for each member of this family. So we don't know what the historical Lazarus was suffering from. However, this story has a strong symbolic significance. I don't know if Rebecca is here, but we talked about symbol this morning. Lazarus is potentially each and every one of us. So for the purpose of this lecture, let us use Lazarus as a metaphor for anybody with Alzheimer's disease. So, the sisters send word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Martha and Mary stay with their brother and ask someone else to give this brief message to Jesus. There is nothing else said about this message. There is no request made and it can hardly qualify as a prayer. So perhaps the sister's approach shows their trust in Jesus because they think he will know what to do. Anyway, they send this message because they're sure about one thing. Jesus cares about what happens to people, people in general, and his friends in particular. Perhaps they do not try to ask for more, for fear of bothering the teacher, like Jairus, the leader of the synagogue in Mark 5, to whom Amy Julia referred to on Tuesday. In any case, this simple one-sentence message sent to Jesus shows a very human and a very understandable attitude. When things really go wrong, we turn to God. And that makes me think of Wanda, whom I met during my research. Wanda said, there she goes, 
I never pray too much, and now I don't know anymore. I want to accompany my mother-in-law on a pilgrimage to the Basilica of Notre Dame of Montagu, which is in Belgium, and all these people going there, there must be a reason for that. No, don't you think? And now, I heard people saying that if Wanda never cared about prayer before, she shouldn't expect any help from God now that she is sick, right? But I would argue that maybe Wanda's illness is an opportunity for her to meet with God. And I'm not saying that God made her ill for, her, for them to meet. I'm saying that maybe if she were open to it, her illness might be an occasion for God and Wanda to meet. Only if she wants it, though. God never forces himself on us. He doesn't violate the temples that we are. And I believe, I wonder, if this possible meeting with God is not the glory that Jesus referred to when he said, upon hearing about Lazarus being sick. Yeah, this sickness will not end in death. It is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. A riddle, a riddle wrapped in a mystery in an enigma, like Keith Doe said to us on Wednesday. What does it mean? I mean, in John's Gospel, Jesus often talks in riddles. It is, I think, John's, John the Evangelist, not John Swinton, of course. It is, who also talks in riddles, but <laughs> it is John's method to make us wonder and reflect. And I don't really know what it means, but apparently, for Jesus, God also needs the sick, the little ones, the most vulnerable people to manifest God's glory. What God reveals to us about God's self and about us through illness and disability and cognitive impairment is one of the keys to understanding God's mystery. And I suppose all of you will agree on that, but in France, this is still not really readily accepted. Now, in our case, where Lazarus represents a person with dementia, Jesus says dementia, this sickness, does not equal death. And that should make us wonder given the current discourse surrounding this disease. People with Alzheimer's disease are often described by those around them as being already dead. And the French gerontopsychiatrist and philosopher Véronique Lefebvre wrote that in societal representation, dementia is the end of being, a white death, a death of the mind before that of the body. And in French, in French, we talk about le deuil blanc, white mourning, a mourning process that takes place even though the person has not died. Like uh, Anita told me, she said to me, my husband is dead. His body is still there, but the man I married, whom I loved, that man is dead. But against this, fatalistic and, and, and tragic discourse, vo voices speak up to highlight the creativity and the subsistence of relational skills, the remaining love for music, as Barbara told us, the snippets of, of waking dreams of people with dementia. And with Christ, I think that these voices say, this disease is not for that. The God of life is also re revealed in the sick person. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Biblical scholars have often questioned this apparent contradiction, right, between Jesus' love for Martha's family and then his immobility when he hears about the disease. But is it really that surprising? John just reveals here a profoundly human aspect of Jesus. Confronted with the announcement of his friend's diagnosis, Jesus remains prostrate, unable to move. The Swiss theologian Thierry Collot speaks of astonishment, 
a state of paralysis that prevents any future projection. And this time of latency is necessary. It allows the person to pull himself together, and it is only after that time of astonishment that Jesus enjoins his disciples to return to Judea. And the Greek text says it quite well, epeita meta toto, which means only after that. Uh, only after that, he said, we'll go to Judea. And uh, I love these paintings of Julia Stankova. Go and look on our website. Yeah. Odile said to me, I always have to prepare myself before I go. And before I go to visit my friend in, in uh, the facility. And this preparation is necessary for her to approach the, fil the, the, the visit calmly. Only after that, Odile is ready to go and see her friend. So I think that John was very right to insist on the delay between the announcement of the illness and Jesus' departure. To do the right thing, it was urgent to wait. And then Jesus adds, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to waking him up. And since the disciples do not fully understand the expression asleep, which is a euphemism for deceased, he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, what is dead? According to a French biblical scholar, Elian Cuvier, Lazarus' dead would be spiritual. Yet, I would like to suggest that if Lazarus suggests, uh, suffers from dementia, his dead is not spiritual. We've had a beautiful testimony by Barbara on, on the, the spiritual acuity, vivacity of, of her father. So I don't think he's spiritually dead, but he might be socially dead. Listen to Alexa's testimony about her friend Maddie. Alexa says, I would almost prefer that Maddie was no longer there rather than half there. I wonder whether it is better to be there or not to be there with this disease, frankly. In any case, for those around her, this disease is horrible. If I were to develop it, I hope to realize it quickly enough so I can commit suicide before. Now, isn't that awful? It's better to be dead than to have Alzheimer's disease, says Alexa. Now, she's not really wrong, because in a sense, we will all be better off when we're dead, because we will be in front of God, right? That's where our Christian hope lies. But still, it is a non-argument to say that a patient would be better off dead. Still, by preventing them from living fully, patients are condemned to a social death. And this social death is the result of what Tom Kitwood and Stephen Sabbath, but also John, call malignant positioning. It is a deadly attitude where persons with Alzheimer's disease are no longer socially considered. Their lives no longer valued, their opinions no longer taken into account. Yes, for some, the person with Alzheimer's disease is dead. Lazarus is dead. But that is not the end of the story. So they go, and when Jesus at last arrives in Bethany, he meets with Martha and Mary. I'm not going to go through all the passage because we'll be here still tomorrow. Um, but Martha and Mary both regret he's not coming earlier. If only you had been here, if only. Don't we hear that very often when people get really sick? Ach, if only I hadn't smoked so much, if only I had moved more, if only, if only, maybe I wouldn't. And Jesus doesn't even try to argue. Isn't that funny? He doesn't, he doesn't answer. He just tries to anchor Martha's vision in the present. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And then he opens a perspective of hope. Hope for me. Whoever believes in me will never die. By redirecting her gaze, Jesus invites Martha to embrace life in, abun in abundance today and invites her to rejoice in the peace that Christ brings 
even in the face of suffering and death. Salvation is happening today, is what Jesus is saying. Do you believe this, even in the face of dementia? Still, the trust and the faith that Jesus testifies to does not put him above the fray. Verses 33 and 35 show us how deeply touched Jesus is by what is happening. His reaction, though, is very different from the other protagonists who loudly weep. I have here lament, but it's the same word. Weep in, in Greek is klaio, and it's loud vo vocifering to, to voice the compassion with the sisters, right? Now, the verbs used by John to describe Jesus' attitude are embrimaomai and, where's the other one? Paraso. And it's funny because embrimaomai is actually um, the snorting of an angry house, horse, sorry, the snorting of an angry horse. And I think Melissa Connor could tell us what that sounds like. Um, and Paraso is being confused, being disconcerted. And I think that often the fact that Jesus seems to disapprove the noisemakers is not sufficiently pointed out. I readily associate these noisemakers to those who claim that dementia is a disaster. It is the end of the world. It is the end of your life. And these people forget that the person is still there with her dignity as a person loved by God, even if her personality and her character has undergone profound changes after the onset of the disease. I believe that this noisy reaction of the crowd troubles Jesus even more than the disease itself. And he seems kind of worried when he asks the crowd what they have done with Lazarus. Where have you put him? He asked him. Now, if Lazarus had died physically, Jesus' question would just mean, where did you bury him, right? Where is his tomb? But in my reading, Lazarus is socially dead. The question could then mean, what have you done to him? Or more precisely, how do you consider him? Is he a burden? Is he someone precious? Is he still fully alive? Or is he dead? Indeed, the malignant positioning discourse surrounding people with dementia often functions like a tomb. As soon as the diagnosis is made, the patient is labeled lost. Attitudes toward himself, his own attitude, but also that of the people around him, often changes. Any atypical behavior becomes a possible indicator of an aspect of the disease. The person finds himself in a straitjacket, and all his actions are interpreted through the prism of dementia. And there is another interpretation of Jesus' question. Maybe Jesus asks the crowd, where did you place him? In which residential care facility? And I don't think there's any blame in the question. It is motivated only by Jesus' concern for Lazarus. When a, let's, let's face it, when a person in the advanced stages of dementia uh, remains at home, she often gets lost, forgets to eat, like Betty, or puts other people around her at risk, and that is what happened to Marguerite. Her children had to play, make the decision to place her because she had accidentally set fire to her apartment. So most physicians just comply with the profession's protocol, right? Ensuring the safety of the patients and the family. It is for the safety of the patients that protected units are closed units. And I don't think anyone places his family member with a cheerful heart in a protected living unit. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. 
Last year, the French National Council for Ethics asked, I think, an essential question, though. They said, can we force elderly people to live in places where they do not wish to be, and on top of that, for which they have to pay a lot of money? They left it up to us to answer the question, but I think it's the right question to ask. You see, far from his own family and friends, Lazarus and, and any person with dementia like, like Betty may be safe, but more often than not, the situation is experienced as unsatisfactory, as a matter of having no other choice. Now, obviously, I would not imply that these facilities are tombs, far from it. These are primarily places where staff strives to allow residents to live. But let's face it, there is no denying the disruption that institutionalization represents for the sick person. Véronique Lefebvre writes, for the Alzheimer patient, leaving home means dying slowly, surely sliding towards death. Placement is frequently accompanied by tears. So it is no wonder that at the sight of the tomb, Jesus weeps. These are not the noisy laments of the Jews and the bystanders. The verb da cruo means to shed silent tears, real tears, tears of deep sadness. And it is not because Lazarus is sick. It is because he has been put in a tomb, in a straitjacket, far from his community, far from our consideration. And the Jews in the account, they see in these tears a proof of Jesus' love for Lazarus. And, and they're right on target. Jesus is moved to the core when he sees what happens to people with cognitive impairment. But this love for the sick person raises in some other people the unavoidable question, if he loves him so much, why doesn't he heal him? We've talked a lot about healing with uh, David, uh, Sarah, and, and Bethany uh, yesterday. Some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Why does Jesus not heal everyone? Why does not God prevent evil? And as Andy said on Tuesday, if he loves me, why does he put me in this situation? But the questions of the theodicy remain unanswered by Jesus. He just, just like in the face of the noisy lamentations, expresses again his disapproval with the sound of an angry house, horse. And then he says, take away the stone. Jesus asks the bystanders to open the tomb. Isn't it interesting to see how Jesus associates the crowd with the event? Yesterday, Bethany McKinley uh, Fox already talked about the crowd in, in the Bartimaeus uh, story. So here it is again, the crowd. <laughs> Martha warns Jesus, and I love some of the English translations that say, he stinks already. This mention of the stench, of course, must underline the reality of Jesus of Lazarus' death. That is in John's context, but what does it mean to us in the case of Alzheimer's disease? Smells are very evocative, very suggestive, and when I get to a protected living unit, I'm very often confronted by this faint, sweetish smell that sort of floats there, and that is really unpleasant to me. I do understand that it's there to hide the more pungent odors of, of excrements and, and, and urine and, and sweat, but still, it is always very confronting to me. And when I talk to people uh, about these smells, somebody said to me, I don't want to go into these units because everything there smells of death. That's interesting, no? But Jesus, once again, he just ignores Martha's remark, and he repeats to her that if she believes, she will see the glory of God. Martha's fate is put to the test here. 
But Jesus' word is uncompromising. If you want things to change, you have to start to believe that change is possible. Can we take away the stone of prejudice? Are we able to believe that we can change our perception of dependence, of disease, of impairment and old age? Do we, have, do we have faith in the human being and her ability to adapt? Do we have faith in God, who is with us, in this undertaking? The account does not say how Mary responds to Jesus' remark. The Gospel just says, they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. So the crowd of passers-by, they get in motion and they remove the stone of prejudice. And perhaps Jesus' true triumph is precisely in the obedience of the crowd to his word. But Jesus immediately directs attention to the one who sent him, his father, who is the source of his word and his action. Now, I find it surprising in this prayer that Jesus says that he has already been heard, while the miracle of Jesus of Lazarus' recovery has not yet taken place. Wouldn't that be because Jesus' true request to his father is that the crowd open the tomb and free Lazarus from the shackles and allow the sick man to return to the consideration of the community? And never forget that Christ commands us to remove the stones and open the tombs ourselves. It is our task, much like he asks elsewhere that we feed the hungry crowds ourselves. And then, we're getting towards the end, stay with me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. So, after praying, Jesus does not enter the tomb, which in my reading symbolizes the, the straitjacket of, of prejudice, right? It is important to note that he doesn't get in. He doesn't try to fit in into the straitjacket, and he doesn't impose himself on Lazarus. He lets Lazarus decide if he wants to get out. He gives him the choice. You want to come? You want to stay? It's up to you. We shouldn't always decide for other people, not even if they have dementia. What is decisive here is whether we trust in Christ when experiencing illness, whether we dare to believe that Jesus comes to us in this experience and calls us out of the tomb. Christ is acting and moving towards us, but the patient is not a passive receiver. He is called not to indulge himself in this situation as a sick person. Don't forget, Lazarus is in a safe place. Coming out of the tomb, breaking through the conventional barriers of dementia prejudice, means taking a great risk. It means being exposed to critique, having to fight against prejudice, and some people may just not feel up to all this. But Whenever someone with dementia does want to make a statement and won't be push pushed aside, then the person will need friends to help him. And here we are. That is the role of the friend, to make possible an exit and to allow the connection with the outside world. Odil said, every time I go and see Maggie, uh, I tell her about what I do on Sundays and I talk about her about the morning service and. I allow her to connect with the outside world. She says, it's important to maintain the connection. And to allow this connection, Jesus does not spare himself. He screams, according to the Greek text. And as with the snorting of an angry house, we are very, very far from this consensual image of a gentle and humble Jesus. It takes some certain inner strength, right, to counter these stereotypes. And what is also important to note is that this powerful intervention of Jesus is necessary for Lazarus to come out. It wasn't enough for the crowds to remove the barriers. It was only when his friend called out to him that Lazarus could turn outwards. There it is again, the role of the healthy friend 
to allow the sick friend to connect to the outside world. And Fred said to us, his wife Iris went uh, to concerts with friends and sometimes with me and sometimes not and, and sometimes they would just walk with her and she would just love it. Yeah, she was just thought it was really nice. Uh, yeah, Marie-Jo said the same thing. It's nice for, other, for, 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 for these people to be taken out and sometimes they'll smile to us, sometimes they will just say thank you, but taking them outside is an important task of the friend. Now when Jesus Christ pierces the tomb, it says, No, it doesn't say that in the text. <laughs> okay, that's what it said. So the dead man came out. The Greek text says, tetnaikos, to designate the one who comes out of the tomb. So it is the dead man, socially dead, who comes out of the tomb. And that means that Lazarus does not just wobble out and fresh and dashing, unencumbered by everything that preoccupied him? Not at all. He who comes out of the tomb is not autonomous and independent. And I think the head cloth is there to remind us that Lazarus remains ill because Jesus is not a miracle cure for dementia. Lazarus remains trapped by the prejudice of society and he'll be unable to get on by his own. He will, for the rest of his life, be dependent on those who care for him. Now, caring for others and receiving care from others is a crucial aspect of human thriving, of human flourishing. But very often it is, is perceived as degrading. And John Swinton, here he comes, writes that to be in a position where one can only be the recipient of care is not degrading, it is in fact a holy place. To receive care is a deep reflection of divine love for dependent human beings. I couldn't have said it, John did. Thank you, John. Now, the relationship of dependence of humans to the creator provides a key to positive interpretation of dependence. And dependency then becomes what brings us closer to God. Thierry Collot said, we can draw an analogy here with interhuman dependence and see it as what brings us closer to each other by breaking down barriers between us. And I think that is a key issue. And so I'm also going to cite Joyce Ann Mercer, who wrote that, God's call in older adulthood invites even those with frail bodies and frail minds to serve the neighbor as caregiver and care receiver. Both of them are graced by one another's presence. And I know it's not always easy to accept that others take care of you. And it may be even more difficult to see that in this interaction between the caring friend and the friend being cared for, there is some reciprocity Sometimes John's book begins like that, uh, the one on becoming friends of time, that being in the presence of a person with dementia can bring serenity and peace. And sometimes people with dementia take care of their friends. Mary told me, my friends know that they can come in and I will always be there to listen to them. She's in the locked unit, so she's always there. I need them, but they know I am here when they need me. And she looks at me and, he, and she says, isn't that the reciprocity of friendship? So the same goes for the following testimony of my encounter with Betty. So Betty is in this um, care facility and I walk up to her and she says, I'm here. And she looks me straight into the eyes and I say, yes, you are here and you are charming. And she smiles at me and she touches my arm and she says, you're a sweetie. 
And she says this, and she puts her forehead against mine. And so we stay like that for a little while. And suddenly she says, one day you must take care of them. And she looks across the table to the other residents. And I was so surprised by her concern for these other people. And I say, yeah. And one day I will have to learn that I will be taken care of. And she says, yeah, just like I, just like me. And you know, Betty knows it. She has to accept that people take care of her, she who has so long taken care of others. But not all of her friends have accepted this and some stopped coming to see her when she moved into the Alzheimer unit. And I think it's to these one-time friends that Jesus is saying, unwrap her and let her go. Let go of your negative attitudes and your negative gaze. It's not just about the physical challenge about getting Betty out of her care unit. It's about her being free of our negative gaze. It is a matter of the heart, really. Because if two, their friends, Betty and Lazarus, are socially dead, their social resurre resurrection cannot take place if the whole community does not participate committedly. So, that is why Jesus calls once again upon the Jews and the passers-by and says, unwrap him and let him go. I understand, get rid of your prejudice and see the possibilities of a life with dementia. This call to the community invites everybody to understand that the liberation from the shackles of malignant positioning is a community project. There is a holy task for all of us to do justice to the inner world of these modern voiceless persons, to make them feel belong. Christopher um, Reikauer sp spoke about the liberation spirit this morning. I think these people need to be liberated from prejudice. I don't think liberation theology is something old fashioned from the 70s. I think it's the heart of the gospel. And voices are raised in our society to cry this out with Jesus untie the sick, let them go. There is doctors, there is researchers and theologians and community leaders like yourselves and patients and family members. Each in their own way, they fulfill the prophetic role of making sure that the works of God are displayed in every human being, regardless of their health condition. They are the prophets for our time because they make the voice of Christ resonate in our contemporary societies. And so I get to my conclusive remarks. Uh, I didn't have a timekeeper. I haven't got any idea what time it is. Okay. I'm okay? Okay. So just to resume, the account of Lazarus shows us Christ who is victorious over dead, all forms of death, even social death. Now, ch church tradition often sees here a, a, a figure of the resurrection of Christ. Um, every gospel account must be read in the light of Jesus' resurrection. However, I think that John goes through great pain to di differentiate this story from the story of the resurrected Lord. Um, in Jesus' tomb, the bandages and the shroud remained on the ground. Lazarus came out with his head and his hands and his body tied. Lazarus is silent, the risen Lord speaks. Jesus asks the Jew to untie uh, Lazarus, but the risen Lord commands Mary not to touch him. So I think that he who comes out of the tomb in Bethany is a dead man, as the gospel says, whereas the risen Christ is forever the living one. Now, in my research, I'm trying to work on a series of biblical accounts that I would like to present, to present to students in the medical profession in a Christian setting and who will inevitably have to deal with patients with dementia-related problems. And spiritual care in the French-speaking context is really something that we're looking into and everybody's talking about it, but I've looked into the programs of our medical students and there's not really much 
interest for the, well, they say that you, they have to be interested in the spiritual world of their patients, but nobody really cares about the way they nourish their spirituality. So that is one of the things I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to give it back to religious communities, um, universally designed, so that we can talk about these questions with people with and without dementia, with people with and without uh, disabilities and even intellectual disabilities. So I'd like to make something for everybody. And um, yeah, I'll forget. If you want to hear about Meister Eckert, come and see me. So um, as I said, this is just a few bricks of an ongoing research. There is nothing written in marble here. It is all open for discussion. So if you have something to say, this, let's discuss it. Other microphones. Yeah. Questions, thoughts, complaints. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. So it reminds me that in America right now, we're having a debate about assisted suicide. <laughs> and much of what you said resonates a lot with me when I think about the reasons that people say they want assisted suicide um, and the ways in which they talk about a future self they would never want to live mm -hmm. with. And I don't actually know what the legislation around that is in France, but I wonder mm -hmm. if um, what you would say to folks who advocate for assisted suicide um, on the grounds that people should have the right not to live in states they would deem undesirable and how we as religious folks might speak into that in a unique way. Yeah, um, it is a big question and um, assisted suicide is not allowed in, in France. We have what we call uh, la sedation prolongée, sedated prolongée. It means long sedation, so people are put to sleep. Um, in Belgium, it is allowed to ask for euthanasia for assisted suicide. Um, when people ask for it in general, they say that when they get to that stage, they want to be put to sleep, and that is a euphemism. And um, the problem in Belgium is, or well, it's not a yeah, well, it's a problem. It's a, it's a legal problem. Is that when the people get to the stage where they are not able to argue anymore, most of them don't ask it, don't ask to be put asleep, which should make us think, right? So the, the, usually, this the family say, well, they, they, she said that when she got there, she wanted to die, but when you ask the patient, do you want to die? The patient will say no. So this should make us reflect. And then, well, as a Catholic, of course, um, uh, the Catholic Church said in 2008 that the dignity of a human being is assured from the moment of conception until the moment, un until the moment of its natural death. And so the Catholic Church would absolutely not uh, agree to euthanasia. And then the thing is, and, and this is a social issue, um, why are we so so afraid of losing our memories? Why are we so afraid of losing our identity? Or, or we feel that we lose our identity. Um, I talked to young students about this, and one said, well, my grandmother, she really didn't know anything anymore at the very end, but she was at our home, my grandfather was taking care of her, she was very well surrounded, she looked happy, and she said, um, actually, it doesn't frighten me that if I were to become like her, it doesn't frighten me that much. So maybe as people who have faith, we should try to get away some of that fear. I haven't got any 
precise and concrete answers or suggestions to make, but I'm welcome if any of you have uh, to hear them. But I think, yeah. Yep. Uh, Dr. Kurman, thank you so much. <laughs> that was really great. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Jason. Thank you. Um, and you probably know this, but uh, the Gospel of John was Jean Vanier's favorite gospel. I know. <laughs> and I think you, your hermeneutic is perfectly matched with his, so thank you for that. My question is if you have what, want to discuss any more your, what you understand as this friendship model of disability. Um, do we need another model? Um, um, I'm not going to discuss it, Jason, because we, I think we don't need another model. I do think that we need to change our looks upon ourselves to see that all people are worthy of our friendship and it's nice when you, be, when you are friends with people that are different from you. And uh, that is something that we can learn our children in, in church. Um, and we can learn that through catechesis and, and religious education. So I think we have a role to play here because I do not believe that making a building accessible is going to make the people inside friends. But as a church, we can bring that message to, to the children and the youngsters and the older people um, that people with or without disabilities, people with or without dementia, they're all it's so nice to be with them. And that's something we have to learn. And forget about the model, it's just, yeah. Thank you for all that you brought to this. Um, I'm very curious about your research. And I work with Barb Newman and we try to help churches be inclusive. So I love what you say about it's really the reverse. Churches are simply a place where friendship can happen and that's where inclusion really will go. And I'm excited about thinking more about that. I actually have a, a question though about individuals with dementia who may not have had faith previously. Mm. Have you witnessed, do you have insights on persons with dementia and any more openness or hardness of their own thinking and their own value? Is, have you seen individuals come to faith and, and learn of salvation and know the Lord Jesus in their experiences with dementia? Okay, I wish I could say yes to that. Um, I cannot, but that may just be because I lack experience and I think John would have something to say on that maybe. You don't. But it's, it's, it is one of my questions. It's in, it's in my research uh, project. Like, do people who did not have faith before can, can come to it? I haven't got an answer to it, but it's on my question list. Uh, Mike, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much uh, for your inclusive approach uh, in that presentation. My question is, um, are there different experiences that people with dementia uh, have in uh, different settings? For example, in hospital settings, home care settings, or general community settings? Mm -hmm. And if there are different experiences, how do you bring um, these experiences together to articulate um, that inclusive approach that you have just presented. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for that question and that is actually a very difficult question. Um, I think that sometimes, no, in an inclusive, welcoming society, we'd all be together, dementia or not, and everybody would be happy, right? That is our celestial Jerusalem, our heavenly Jerusalem, and we're not there yet. So in the present world where we are living, we have all these op options of hospitals and residential care units and uh, people living with dementia at home, and some people being very happy to be at home, some are mistreated. So there is no, I don't think there's a, perfect solution or a perfect situation right now. I'm ma ma mainly focusing on people in residential care units because I find that very hard. I visited a lot of them and um, I cannot say that I have seen very happy situations and I think that is because we try to lock these people out of our society and maybe we should not try to get them back into society because that is very difficult because of all the medical issues and because of all the safety problems, but maybe we can get society in the residential care unit. Um, and so the inclusion works both ways. 
Um, I think we should open more these residential care units and allow people to, from the community to get in, which is not always easy because it's very often closed at the times when people are free to get into it. So there is still some work to do. Um, I'm not going into people being at home, not yet, so I can't really uh, answer to that, but I, I think that as religious communities, we should be aware that there are people living at home and being isolated and see how we can bring them back into the community. Never forget them. Thank you. Uh, got the balance wrong. Um, I really appreciate your work. Um, so my grandmother died of Alzheimer's back in Easter of 09. And I noticed throughout your presentation that you said that Lazarus is socially dead. Would you also make that claim of all people with dementia? Because I know from my experience with my grandmother that she was not socially dead. She did not have all of her memories, but when people were around, she was very much alive. Yeah, yeah. when I talk about socially dead, it's, I, I think the people are not socially dead. I think that a lot of peop the people around them considered them dead. So that's, that is a very different perspective. And no, the, people, the person with Alzheimer is not dead to her, her or his social environment and is not spiritually dead and is very much alive. That is all that I'm trying to say. When I talk about social dead, it's the malignant positioning that puts them in this position of... Yeah, you want to reply? Did, oh no, sorry, okay. Um, so no, the person is not socially dead and, and remains open to, res to uh, stimulus for a very, very long time. It's sometimes at the very, very end. Um, I don't know how you call that, when they get into fetal position. And then sometimes communication gets very difficult. But even then, um, most of these people stay aware of what happens around them. So no, they are not socially dead. They're considered socially dead. Okay, thank you for, but, but good thing you say it, so I must precise that. Thank you, yeah. I'll take for one more question. Okay. Um, so thank you, Talitha. Um, bringing in Lazarus has just brought a new dimension. My own mom died from Alzheimer's, complications mm. with Alzheimer's a number of years ago. And my, it's really more of a comment and a sharing, kind of affirming the awareness you talk about. I lived in California, my mother was in Massachusetts, so I would see her once a year and would sort of just pour myself, try to pour myself into her when I would see her. And I remember one time, and this is when she really wasn't talking. My family, my immediate family that lived in the area saw her as unresponsive and unaware. Um, and she said, hello, baby doll, which was my, her name for me. And, and my dad was in the same nursing home, paralyzed on the left side from a stroke. And one day she walked by his room and said, my husband's in that room. I mean, he called me crying. So how much she knew, but a lot more than we thought. Thank you. Yeah. Coming out of the fog, you called it coming out of the fog, and, and Stephen Sabat calls it the untangled veil. And uh, yeah, um, I think the coming out of the fog are moments of grace that we have to cherish. Um, sometimes they're not there, right? And even then, we do not know what happen, what's happening inside. Um, so we must be very, very careful and very, very respectful for people with dementia. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's quite interesting that you should finish with that idea of coming out of the fog because it's actually Jean Vanier's idea when he, he writes about Alzheimer's. Yeah, so that's a gift as well. Talitha, thank you very much indeed. It's a wonderful presentation, gentle, sensitive, informative. What more could we ask for? So thank you very much. <laughs>